Hello, welcome to the first ever, first annual, first ever book problems from a chapter. This is going to be on the unit for work, energy, and simple machines. Good luck. Have a pencil, pad, and your calculator and work along with me. Try to prove each slide and try to predict each answer before I get to it. So let's begin. A force sets an object in motion. When the force is multiplied by the time of its application, we call the quantity impulse, which changes the momentum of that object. What do we call the quantity of force times distance? Force times distance, that is going to be work or the object's energy. That's pretty much um, definition. That's not a lot of thought going into that. Work is required to lift a barbell. How many times more work is required to lift the barbell three times higher? Distance and work are proportional. They are direct. So three times higher means three times the work. Which requires more work? Lifting a 10 kilogram load a vertical distance of 2 meters or lifting 5 kilogram load a vertical distance of 4 meters? Force times distance. 10 times 2 is 20. 5 times 4 is 20. It looks different, but it is actually the same. It's both 10 kilograms, a vertical distance of 2 meters. That is mass is 10 kilograms or a force of 100, so that's 200 meter, 200 joules and five kilograms times 10 times four is also 200 joules. Okay, now next. How many joules of work are done on an object when a force of 10 newtons pushes it a distance of 10 meters? That's 10 newtons times 10 meters, that equals 100, that's very simple. How much power is required to do 100 joules of work on an object in the, in the time of 0.5 seconds? So that's going to be work divided by time. So that's 100 divided by 0.5 is going to be 200 watts. And how much work, how much power is required if the same amount of work is done in one second? So it would be less power, it would be 100 watts. And then what are the two main forces of mechanical energy? That is something that is very odd. People don't really understand this. If you understand this, you are way ahead of most people. The two main forms of mechanical energy are potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, potential energy is a little weird. What we usually study is we, we study gravitational potential energy. In other words, potential energy based on height of some things. When you go up, a, when you go up an incline or something's pulled with a pulley. But potential and kinetic energy, and I'll explain that a little bit more in the next few slides. 7A, if you do 10 joules of work to elevate a bucket of water, what is its gravitational potential energy relative to its starting position? Okay, so if you if you have 100 joules, uh, what is going to be the potential energy? So A would be, uh, if you do 100 joules of work to elevate a bucket of water, what is its gravitational potential energy relative to its starting position? Uh, 100 joules, I guess. I mean, uh, what would the gravitational energy be if the bucket were raised twice as high? It would be 200 joules, twice 100 joules. Uh, see, in, in A, you're doing, it says you're doing 100 joules of work to elevate the bucket. So you're starting with 100 joules of kinetic energy, and then that's being converted into potential energy. If you go twice as high, you have twice as much converted. So 
So think of uh, the kinetic energy it starts with, and that's how it gets up there. Uh, a boulder is raised above the ground so that its potential energy relative to the ground is 200 joules. Then it's dropped. What is the kinetic energy before it hits the ground? It's going to give up the 200 joules, so it'll be 200 joules. Okay, you you put 200 joules of energy in, you dropped it, and you release 200 joules. Uh, so it'd be a positive 200 joules. Now here we have the the boulder up top, uh, where you have the kinetic energy. Well, let's explain this one more time. If you're comparing the initial and final. In other words, the ground is the initial and up top is the final. Uh, if you're looking at the kinetic energy, kinetic energy the final would be zero because you got it up there and you're done. It's all converted to potential energy. And then if you subtracted that from the initial kinetic energy, you'll have a small number, zero, minus a positive number or a larger positive number and that'll be equal a negative value but now if I'm dropping the if I'm dropping it so the final kinetic energy is large just before it hits the ground obviously when it hits the ground it gives up its kinetic energy uh, it's transferred to other things so the final kinetic energy just before it hits the ground is very high so it's a high number, final, minus a small number, zero, is going to be positive change in kinetic energy. So positive or negative depends on the perspective. Is it, it's always finest, final minus initial, and you simply compare one to the other to get the value. So then the value would be uh, 200. But is it positive or negative 200? Well, I purposely left out in number 8 whether it's positive or negative. A boulder is raised above the ground so that its potential energy relative to the ground is 200. It is then dropped. What is the kinetic energy before it hits the ground? So it'll be 200 joules, but just before it hits the ground, so it'll be final 200 joules minus 0 is a positive 200 joules. So it's very important in the future to make sure you understand that when you see change, the change is going to be either negative or positive. The values are always positive, so it's going to be uh, positive 200 minus zero. If you're, if you're bringing it up to the top of the hill, it'll be it'll be final which would be zero minus a positive 200 which would be a negative 200 so you you must consider you must consider the final minus initial if you if you always do that if, if any change is always final minus initial you will never ever be wrong you will never ever be wrong if it gives off energy, it's exothermic. It's an exothermic activity. If it absorbs energy, it's positive. It's an endothermic activity. Now, next. Suppose you know the amount of work the brakes of a car must do to stop a car at a given speed. How much work must they do to stop a car that is moving four times as fast? Well, the relation, this is interesting, the relationship between velocity and kinetic energy is going to be a squared function. So let's say it's one half the mass, let's say that's constant, let's say that the mass is two, so one half of two is one, okay. So then you put in the velocity, let's say it's one. So one squared times one times two times one half of that is is going to be one, okay. Now. So one half the mass, one half of two is one. So that's we're going to say that's constant. Now we're going to increase the velocity to two. So it'll be one times four is four. So it goes from one to four. Let's say we triple it. Let's say it's three. Okay, one half of two is one times three squared is nine. So it goes.
from 1 to 9. Pretty significant. So the relationship is a squared function. How does speed affect the friction between a road and a skidding tire? Speed does not affect friction. Friction is based on the normal. What will be the kinetic energy of an arrow having a potential energy of 50 joules after it is shot with a bow, 50 joules? Now that's not gravitational potential energy. That is simply work times distance. You're pulling it back and you're giving it uh, its kinetic energy which is translated from the potential energy. What does it mean to say that in any system the total energy score stays the, sh stays the same? That's based on the fact that energy is neither created nor destroyed, but it can change, it can transform, but you still can account for the energy. And the reason you can account for the energy is based on the law energy of conservation or energy is conserved. In what sense is energy from cool coal actually solar energy? Well, coal comes from terrestrial plants, terrestrial plants, uh, trees and bushes and shrubs and those sorts of things that died millions of years ago, was covered over by dirt um, through, uh, through pressure and time and, and heat, it was transformed to coal. But originally, the plant absorbed the energy from the sun through photosynthesis and eventually converted it to coal. It is less than the, the um, how does the amount of work done on an automobile by its engine relate to the energy content of the gasoline? Uh, it is less than the energy uh, in, the, in, the, in the gasoline because so much is wasted. Combustion engines are very ine inefficient. In what two ways can a machine alter alter an input energy. It can change its magnitude and or direction. Right. Number 16, in what way is the machine subject to the law of conservation of energy? Well, it's like anything else. It's subject to the law of conservation of energy. Uh, work uh, out cannot equal work in. It may seem easier when you're applying a smaller force, but it's the same amount of work. It just seems easier. Uh, it takes you longer, uh, but it's the same amount of energy. And that's something that students find hard to understand. What does it mean to say that a machine has a certain mechanical advantage? Well, like it says in the answer, it can multiply forces by a certain amount. In other words, the, the actual mechanical advantage is how is is how much the the uh, the force output is a multiple of the force input so it says in the answer it can multiply by a certain amount well let's put it this way it can divide by a certain amount but if you divide by a certain amount you've got to also change the distance as well uh, in which type of lever is the output force smaller than the input force? Well, type 3 always. Uh, there's a, a, a problem online about the waitress. Uh, type 1 maybe, it depends on where the fulcrum is. There's a, if the fulcrum is closer to the person who is the machine operator, then it, it, it is. Uh, and then the next one is 35%. Right. Distinguish between theoretical mechanical advantage and actual mechanical advantage. How would these compare if a machine were 100% efficient? Um, theoretical is the same as ideal. IMA and TMA are actually the same. And the, uh, the IMA, there's no friction. It's just distances. Distances don't lie. Uh, uh, AMA is based on forces, and forces can lie because there's always going to be friction. When I say it can lie, I mean it can contain friction. So uh, IMA is without friction, AMA is with friction, and if it were 100%, which is extremely unlikely, uh, if ever, it would never happen that way. Uh, I'm not sure in outer space that you would have, you know, you would always, you'd have friction somewhere. Even in outer space, you'd go, you're going to have friction, uh, depending on the machine. Um, what is the efficiency of her body when a cyclist expends 1,000 
watts of power to deliver mechanical energy to the bicycle at the rate of 100 watts. Well, 10%. So it's going to be 1 over 100 over 1,000, which is 10%. Look that up and make sure that makes sense. In what sense are our bodies machines? Like machines, our bodies need energy uh, and energy supply. Also, the same principle of combustion occurs in the metabolism of food, in the body, and the burning of fossil fuels. Um, our body is like a machine, but it's mostly like a car. Uh, you put energy in, you have a lot of waste energy, and the waste energy is in the form of heat. You have a temperature. Uh, that means that you're burning even more energy than you should. Uh, what is the ultimate source of energy derived from the burning fossil fuels from dams and from windmills? The sun. The sun. And people, you know, people see lava, you know, they, they see uh, this molten rock. And, you know, where did it come from? Where did all this molten rock come from? Well, it came from the earth. Well, is it because the earth hasn't hardened yet? You know, is it still in the hardening process? Well, no. Uh, radioactivity gives off tremendous amounts of energy, like the atomic bomb exploding. Uh, that there's a source of energy there. And the the geothermal energy is, is not from hot water or it's not from... You know, the Earth not hardening yet is from radioactivity. Radioactivity is a source of all thermal energy. Can we correctly say that a new source of energy is hydrogen? Why or why not? Now, see, hydrogen is not a new source of energy because it takes energy to extract hydrogen from water and carbon carbon compounds. So there's there's you got to pay the piper somehow. So if you're going to use hydrogen and mix with oxygen, you, you've got to you got to separate it from the oxygen and then and then combine it again. The, the thing about hydrogen cells, hydrogen and oxygen cells, fuel cells, is that there's less friction. It's more efficient. Uh, it's still the same amount of energy, but the efficiency is much greater uh, with fuel cells. So, um, next. Now, this is going to be a three-slide problem. It says the mass and speed of three vehicles are shown. A. Rank the vehicles by momentum from greatest to least. Rank the vehicles by kinetic energy from greatest to least. They are the answers, BAC and CBA. So we want to um, rank the vehicles by momentum from greatest to least. So the greatest momentum. So MV, uh, which ones are MV? The greatest MV from uh, greatest to least. And then rank the vehicles kinetic energy from greatest to least. So what's going the fastest? Um, <clears throat> would be the greatest kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, so you would uh, calculate uh, the energy based upon uh, mv squared, uh, one half mv squared. So when I say that you want to rank the vehicles by momentum from greatest to least, think mv, so v is involved, and one half m, which would be a constant. You'd be changing the velocity. So make sure you know what I mean by that. And if you don't, ask me in class. Rank the vehicles by kinetic energy from greatest to least. So again, we have we have a velocity involved. So the mass and speed of three vehicles are shown on the next slide. Each A and B involve a um, velocity. And actually the mass may change. So let's take a look. All right, so <clears throat> so just multiply them. You have you have one times eight hundred is eight hundred. Two times thousand is two thousand. That that wins easily. And then eight times ninety. Hmm, this is very interesting. So let's see. Momentum B would be the likely first. Okay, eight times ninety. Eight times ninety. Hmm, eight times nine is what? What is eight? times 9. Well, let's see. What's 9 times 8? Well, nine, 10 times 8 is 80. 10 times 8 is 80. So you have 9 less than that. Uh, so that would be 72. So 720. So you'd have 800, 2,720. So it looks like the BAC would be the answer to the first one. Now let's see. 1 half MV squared. So 1 half, that's 400 times 1. That's 400, all right. 
and then 500 times 4, which would be 2,000, see, one half, one half mv squared, one half of 1,000 is 500, and then 2 squared is 4, so 4 times 500 is 2,000, and then 1 half of 90 is 45, 45 times 8 squared, hmm, this is an interesting problem. So, you're going to want to get out your calculators uh, to do this. Um, you're going to want to get out your calculators and plug those numbers in and see what you think. All right. So, according to this, according to this, BAC is what we said. And <clears throat> even though C has a very small mass, it's its velocity, remember the velocity is squared. So look at A. A has the smallest momentum, but it's going to have the largest kinetic energy. Isn't that interesting? So one half of the mass, right, one half of the mass, that's what was it, 9 kilograms or 90 kilograms, that's 45. But look at the velocity. It's, it's, it's 8 squared or 64. 64, where the other ones have a small velocity. One was uh, 2 and the other one was 1. So easily, 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 C has a much greater greater kinetic energy. So the, the rules that apply to momentum are a little different because the momentum and the velocity are direct and linear. Direct and linear. The velocity and kinetic energy is direct but parabolic, direct but parabolic, direct but exponential, direct but parabolic as opposed to the momentum which is direct and linear. So the um, C will will win out in B and I think that's, a, 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 I think that's significant. Okay, it says consider the four situations. You have three kilogram ball at rest on top of a five meter hill. Four kilogram ball at rest on a five kilo, uh, five meter hill. So right away you want to say, well, you know, the potential energy is greater in B than in A. All right, good. And then a three kilogram ball at two meters per second atop a five meter hill. A four kilogram ball moving at two meters per second at ground level. Rank from greatest to least the potential energy of each ball. Greatest to least the, the potential energy of each ball. Well, let's see. It says B is the answer uh, for the greatest potential energy, and that makes sense. Well, yeah, because it would be uh, 4 times 10 is 40, times 5, which would be 200 joules, a 3 kilogram ball moving at 2 meters per second atop a a hill, well, you're talking about potential energy, so that makes perfect sense. Well, let's before the slide changes, let's move on to the others. Rank the greatest, rank from greatest to least the kinetic energy of each ball. Uh, that would be D, C, which is also moving, uh, and then rank the greatest to least the total energy of each ball. Well, what what I would suggest doing, what I would suggest doing, is um, looking at the potential and kinetic energies of each and, and calculating it as such. <clears throat> a ball is released at the left end of a metal track shown below. We'll, we'll look at that track in a second. Assume it, assume it has only enough friction to roll but not to lessen its speed. Hmm, that's an interesting, uh, that's interesting. If it didn't have any friction, could it roll? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> Rank from greatest to least the ball's momentum at each point. Rank from greatest to least the ball's kinetic energy at each point. And rank from greatest to least the ball's potential energy at each point. So that's going to be very, very, very interesting. So we're going to have a track, and the track is going to be at different levels, you know, different heights, different uh, gravitational heights. Um, a, B, C, D. A will be the highest, B will be next, C will be lowest, and D will be 
equivalent to B, as is obvious in the answers A, B, C. So uh, the next problem we're going to do, uh, this problem, is going to involve a trek. So I just want to, I just want to address one thing. If 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 something doesn't have any friction, can it roll? Well, how does something roll? It rolls with friction. That's like saying a car. Can a car roll uh, if it has no friction? No, the tires are really what makes it roll. Uh, so if there's no friction, then it's not going to roll. Very dangerous. So you can see where A is the highest. Uh, so uh, B is next. C is the lowest. So isn't that going to be the highest kinetic energy, where A would be the highest potential energy, C would be the lowest potential energy, A would be the lowest kinetic energy. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, and B and D are obviously going to be equal for everything, because they're at the same height. When you're talking about potential energy and potential energy changes and kinetic energy that's tied to potential energy, it's all based on height. It's all gravitational potential energy, gravitational potential energy. So uh, this is going to be kind of interesting to look at. Uh, so you you got a visual here. So now we're going to look at the answer and uh, see, what's, see what's what. This is actually an interesting problem we're doing in that I'm going to have to change the timing of the slides. I'm kind of killing time a little bit trying to uh, trying to wait. I have a hundred seconds on each slide. So this is, uh, this is good. This is, uh, we're learning. Uh, but uh, I, wa I want you to go back to the slide before, the problem before, and calculate those kinetic and potential energies. Uh, that's going to be very important to do. Remember, the, the sum of the kinetic and potential energies have to equal a constant. Uh, so that's going to be very important. Okay, now, let's look at the, the problem itself. All right. A ball is released from left to left end of a metal track as shown. Assume it has enough friction to roll, but not to lessen its speed. Rank from greatest to least the ball's momentum at each point. Well, let's see. Mass times velocity. It's going to reach its greatest kinetic energy at C, so that'll be its greatest velocity. So C will be first. Uh, A will be last. B and D will be equal. So that makes sense. Rank from greatest to least the ball's kinetic energy, same thing. Uh, it's giving up its kinetic energy. And the potential energy would be the opposite. Potential energy would be the highest point A, the lowest point C, and that's the answer. So uh, again, when you're, when you're talking about potential and energy changes relative to gravitation, high high gravity, high, uh, sorry, high position is going to equal high kinetic and high potential energy and low position, low height is going to be high kinetic energy. So if I'm pulling a bow string back, that's not gravitational potential energy, that's something different, that's related to to work done. I do work on a string to pull it back. Well then the string does work on the arrow, okay, that's Newton's third law. Okay, I I, I put I I initiate a force. I, I put a force on the string. The string puts a force on my hand, and that that's translated to force on the arrow. Okay. The roller coaster ride starts with a car at rest at point A. All right. And uh, when I rank from greatest to least, the car speed at each point. All right. This is going to be very similar to the one we just did. It's going to be very similar to the one we just did. All right. Rank from greatest to least the car's kinetic energy at each point. And then rank from greatest to least the car's potential energy. So we're not looking at momentum anymore. We're looking at A is going to be from greatest to least the car's speed. Uh, so you know, put that in, put car speed, and then kinetic energy, okay, so it would be the lowest points will be the highest kinetic energy, the highest points will be the highest potential energy, 
the greater the kinetic energy, the greater the speed, all right? Uh, then rank from greatest to least, the course potential energy, again, the highest points. This is going to be uh, similar to what we just did in that it's going to be a roller coaster, and the roller coaster will have different uh, hills in it, and each hill will have a different height. So uh, we're going to look at peaks and valleys of a roller coaster ride relative to the hills and the valleys between the hills. So let's look at that for a second, and we see that A is highest. B is not lowest. D would be lowest, isn't it? So it goes, in terms of height, it goes A, D, I'm sorry, not A, D, A, E, C, B, D, or B, in terms of increasing, it would be B, I'm sorry, D as in Darcy, D, B as in boy, <coughs> and then it would be C E A. So you see that? So going from left to right, it would be A, B is not the lowest, C, I'm sorry, not the next highest, so the next highest would be all, all the way over in E, and then it would be C, and then it would be B, and then D. So it would be A, E, C, B, D. Okay, A, E, C, B, D will be the various uh, points. Now, remember, the higher the point, the higher the potential energy. The lower the point, the higher the kinetic energy. Hmm, I think I might put this on your test on kinetic, on uh, work energy in simple machines. This looks like a really good one. I could ask some serious questions on your test. Hint, 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 relative to this problem. So let's look at the answers and, and the questions again and see if we can keep a visual in our minds and uh, and answer some questions relative to this. And I'm going to stop it uh, because I want to change the times of the, the pictures are on. Okay, so let's see if we can remember the picture. All right, it says the roller coaster ride starts with the car at rest at point A. All right, so that's the farthest left. Okay, rank from greatest to least the car's speed at each point. Well, A would be least. Uh, the greatest would be the lowest one, which would be, which would be D. That would be the greatest, and then B would be next lowest, and then C would be next, and then E would be next, and then A. So that's based on the size of the hill or the size of the the uh, you know how how close it is to ground level from point A to ground level so D is lowest I'm sorry D is yeah D is lowest and then B then C then E then A that makes sense okay rank from greatest to least the car's kinetic energy it should be the same it should be the same kinetic energy and uh, and speed are are proportional or direct but careful they're they're not linear direct they're parabolically direct. Okay, and then it says potential energy, so you go from the highest would be A, then E would be next highest, and C, then B, then D, and that makes perfect sense. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut this off, and I'll be back in a minute, and I'm going to change the timing on some of these, uh, some of these values. Okay, take care. Rank the efficiency of these machines from highest to lowest. Um, uh, A through D. Let's see. It's always going to be work output over work input. Why is that? Well, the uh, input and output should, should be the input and output Input should be the same, but the input is always larger because of friction. So it's going to be increasingly less than one if the denominator increases. So 60 over 100 is 60 hundredths or 0.6, 50 over 100 is 50 hundredths or 0.5. 
80 over 200 is the same as 40 over 100 or 0.4 and then 120 over 100 is the same as 60 over uh, 100 uh, 120 over 200 is the same as 60 over 100 so it would be a and d would be equal and then uh, b would be higher than c okay so just remember it's always output over input relative to work and it's always going to be the smaller over the larger and unfortunately work input is always going to be larger because of friction the next one's a little confusing and i want you to give this some thought i'm not sure how much i want to uh, give away relative to this but um, let's look at the let's look at the uh, drawings uh, one two three four those are the masses and four three two one are the velocities and we're going to see which one's going to get farther up the ramp so let's see what the actual question is okay one through four and four through one okay carts moving along a lab for run running car carts moving along the lab floor run up short inclines friction effects are negligible Rank the carts by kinetic energy before they meet the incline. Okay, before they meet the incline. Before they meet the incline. All right, well, that's interesting. Uh, it'll be B, A, C, D. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, you had, remember you had one, two, three, four, and then four, three, two, one. Well, it would be B. One half of two is one, and then, uh, 3 squared is 9, so it would be 9. So it would be, if I recall correctly, 8, 9, and then they get even lower. So it would be A, uh, would be B, A, C, D. Rank the carts by how high they go up the incline. Well, that one's going to be a little weird. That's going to be uh, A, B, C, D. B and A are switched. Why is that? Rank the carts by kinetic energy when they reach the highest point of the incline. That's also kind of weird. And then why are your answers to B and C different? Well, the potential energy at the top equals the kinetic energy in the bo at the bottom. What does that mean? I want you to give that some thought and then ask me about that in class. That's a pretty good problem. So let's look at the, uh, the drawing again. So the uh, kinetic energies are going to be 9, 8, and then that's 4 times 1.5 is 6, and then 2 times 1 is 2. So to go 9, 8, 9, 8, 6, 2. 9, 8, 6, 2. So those are the values. Okay, now. Rank the scale readings from greatest to least. We're going to go look at those scales in a minute. Uh, and then we'll come back to this problem. So let's start with 33. Calculate the work done when a force of 1 newton moves a book 1 meter. So that will be 2, new, uh, two joules. Okay. And then it says calculate the work done when 20 newtons of force pushes a cart 3.5 meters. That'll be... 20 times 3.5 or 70 so these are pretty easy calculate the work done by uh, in lifting a 500 newton barbell 2.2 meters above the ground so that'll be 1100 and that's going to be what the potential energy is that's going to be the amount of potential energy gained so 33 34 35 excuse me are fairly basic it's all based on work equals force times distance uh 32 i want to rank the scale readings from greatest to least like which is going to have the greater thing so according to this a is greatest and then b and c are equal uh, to supporting ropes so you actually have to look at the number of supporting ropes when you're determining the relative effectiveness of a uh, pulley system so let's see uh, 
A is going to be one string. In other words, in other words, the uh, the amount you're pulling this is going to be equal to the load. Okay, equal to the load, and then uh, so that's a little weird. Okay, uh, things switched a little bit, but anyway, A is obviously greatest and B and C are equal okay uh, look at that drawing again and that's going to be very important you can see how in A she's pulling down the um, she's pulling down on the rope and that's kind of uh, that scale reading it's not supported by two strings it's supported by one string it's like how much is being uh, transferred to that so it's a very kind of interesting problem, a little confusing, but uh, A, is, A is the greatest, and then B and C are equal. Okay, it says calculate the, the watts of power expended when a force of one newton moves a book two meters in the time interval of one second. Well, that's two watts. That's going to be one times two divided by one is two. Okay, that's an easy one. Calculate the power expended when 20 newton force pushes a cart 3 meters in 0.5 seconds. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be 20 times 3.5 uh, divided by 0.5, which is 140 watts. It's pretty straightforward. And then it says, um, and then it says, how many joules of potential energy does a one kilogram book gain when it is elevated four meters? How about eight meters? Well, it would be forty, because it would be uh, it would be one kilogram times ten mgh times four is forty, and then it would be one kilogram times ten times eight would be eighty. So that's that's pretty those three problems are fairly straightforward so uh, again this these uh, these PowerPoint slides are from the uh, lecture so that might be something you want to look at as well and what I do is I put the question down and then I have the answers come up separately okay let's see calculate the increase of potential energy when a 20 kilogram block of ice is lifted vertically a distance of two meters so that would be 20 times 10 times 2 is 400 that's easy calculate the number of joules of kinetic energy uh, one kilogram book has when it's tossed across the room at a speed of two meters per second so one half of one is one half or 0 0.5 0 0.5 times 2 squared is 2 so that's pretty straightforward and then how much work is required to increase the kinetic energy of a car by 5,000 joules 5,000 joules I'm not sure I understand the, how that is very difficult but the work equals the delta KE equals 5,000 joules and then it says what change in kinetic energy does an airplane experience on takeoff if it is moved a distance of 500 meters by a sustained net force of <clears throat> 5,000 joules, so work times distance, uh, 5,000 times 5. So in other words, the effort, the, the applied force is 5,000 newtons. I guess they're not, friction is not an issue here. So it'll be uh, 2,500,000 2, joules or 2.5 million joules will be the answer to 42. Right. Next, we want to look at 43, and 43 is a little bit more involved, which which requires more work stretching a strong spring a certain distance or stretching a weak spring the same distance. Well, you're going to have to put, you know, more force in the stronger string, so more force to stretch the strong string, so more work in stretching a strong string. Um, Two people who weigh the same amount climb a flight of stairs. The first person climbs the stairs uh, in 30 seconds, while the second person climbs the stairs 
in 40 seconds which which person does more work well this is the weird one they're both the same they're both the same but the person who climbs it in the quickest amount of time is going to use the most power because it's going to be work over time and the smaller the denominator the larger the quotient so same work done but each same work done by each for same hour climber in 30 seconds uses more power uh, to a shorter time so you know power is a quotient power is a quotient of energy over energy over time and the energy over time is going to be um, joules over time and the smaller the denominator the larger the quotient learn these words numerator denominator quotient those are important words to be able to bandy back and forth uh, comfortably a physics teacher demonstrates energy conservation by releasing a heavy pendulum bob as shown in the sketch i'll show you that next next slide allowing it to swing to and fro what would happen if in his exuberance he gave the bob a slight shove as it left his nose uh, consider the kinetic energy of a fly in a cabin uh, of a fast movie train does it have the same or different kinetic energy relative to the train relative to the ground outside well relative to the train um, you know it'll it'll have a, you know it'll be different uh, if the trains going 40 miles an hour and the fly is going two miles an hour then the fly is going 42 miles an hour if it's going two miles an hour the other way the the against the train then it's going 38 miles an hour so just as just as motion is relative ke is also the, the speed and kinetic energy of the fly are different relative to the train on the ground okay so it's it's uh it's still it's still you know the the difference in kinetic energies is still going to be the same uh, on relative to the train relative to the ground uh, so uh, the next problem is going to be the bob uh, physics teacher demonstrates energy of, of conservation so if it, it's not going to go right back to his nose is it it's going to uh, uh, there it is and he's going to give it a little shove so he's going to give it a little bit more kinetic energy. So you give it a little more kinetic energy, it'll reach a higher height on the uh, on the uh, other side, and then as a result, the result of of hitting a higher height on the other side, it'll come back and essentially bump your nose. So it's going to uh, become higher, and I think that's what the answer is going to say. Uh, it says if the ball is given an initial kinetic energy, it returns to its starting position with that kinetic energy, moving in the other direction, and it will hit the instructor. Uh, the instructor's uh, the instructor's um, uh, nose will possibly be broken. Okay, and let's look at the next slide. Okay, when a driver applies brakes to keep a car going downhill at a constant speed and a constant kinetic energy, the potential energy of the car decreases. Where does this energy go? Where does most of it go in a hybrid vehicle? Well, you know, when you're in a car moving, you're going to have a, a tremendous amount of waste heat. Uh, that's a conventional uh, combustion engine, but if you have a hybrid car you're going to be converting a lot of that uh, kinetic energy into electrical energy and that's heat um, you know it can be later used as heat so electric electrical energy is actually a form of potential energy so is gasoline gasoline is a form of potential energy but a lot of it's wasted in a regular car now let's uh, look at this relative to the fulcrum let's divide the board in half so it would be di over do would be 0.5 over 0.5 in the one on the left that'll be one and then it'll be one or 0.5 plus 0.5 divided by 0.5 which would be two 
and then it would be 0.5 divided by 1, which would be 0.5. So the uh, mechanical energy, the mechanical advantage would be, the ideal mechanical advantage would be 1 to 0.5 in that order. And, and that's what we said, or that's what the answer said in the former slide. And in the uh, upcoming slide, uh, that's also indicated uh, quite clearly that it's going to be uh, 1, 2.5, going from left to right. And there it is, 1, 2.5. Now, uh, the next slide will look at uh, how geothermal uh, energy, how it actually works how it actually works. Dry rock geothermal power can be a major contributor to power with no pollution. The bottom of a hole drilled down into the Earth's interior is fractured, making a large surfaced hot cavity. Water is introduced from the top by a second hole. Superheated water rising to the surface then drives a conventional turbine to produce electricity. What is the source of this energy? Well, it's nuclear decay. We did this problem, sort of a problem like this earlier. A stent man on a cliff has a, poten a potential energy of 10,000. Show that when his potential energy is 2,000, his kinetic energy is 8,000. Well, <laughs> It's got to be, you know, he's on a cliff, 10,000 plus zero is 10,000. So the constant is going to be 10,000. So 2,000, you know, 10,000 minus 2,000 is 8,000. 2,000 plus 8,000 is 10,000. So it's got to equal that constant uh, if you're changing kinetic energy to potential energy, etc. The, the sums of the energy relative to the law of conservation of energy, they must equal that, that constant that constant. If you started with a, a 10,000 kinetic energy, it's going to equal 10,000 potential energy at the top. And the sums again will equal 10,000. Uh, the next slide shows just very quickly the, um, the process of this geothermal energy where you have, uh, you have this, this fracturing and then you have the the water being introduced, and then you have this circulation uh, back up to the power plant. Uh, the next slide shows um, a problem. Relative to the ground below, how many joules of potential energy does a 1,000 Newton boulder have at the top of a 5 meter ledge? All right, let's see. Uh, now, you can see that you know, the mg is given, so it's not going to be a thousand times ten times five. It's going to be simply, you know, mgh, but mg is ten th is a thousand. Um, so it's going to be uh, five thousand joules. If it falls, how much kinetic energy will it have when it strikes the ground? It'll be, uh, it'll be five thousand joules. And then what's its speed going to be? Very important for your test. 1 half mv squared equals mgh and the m's cancel uh, you're left with v equals root 2gh solving through you get the answer of 10 meters per second 10 meters per second so uh, that's a pretty important problem to understand that the m's cancel and you're left with uh, one half uh, mv squared equals mgh. The m's cancel, and you're left with uh, v equals 2gh. Solving through for v, <coughs> you get 10 meters per second. Okay, 52. A hammer falls off a rooftop and strikes the ground with a certain kinetic energy. If it fell from a roof that was four times higher, how would its kinetic energy on impact compare? How would its how would its speed its how would its speed of impact compare? Well, four times higher means four times potential energy, thus four times the kinetic energy. 
Okay, so from KE equals one half MV squared, this means twice the impact speed uh, because four equals two squared. Uh, this result can be obtained from D equals one half MV squared, where the falling from 4D takes twice the time. Twice the time at the same acceleration g means twice the speed. Okay? So you know when you have when you have when you have twice the speed, it means four times the energy. Uh, three times the speed is nine times the energy. So it's very simple actually if you think about it. The answer here seems very complicated, but if it's four times the kinetic energy it's got to be twice the speed. Okay, so you you double the speed, you quadruple the energy. Very simple. Uh, I think this answer from the book is a little bit uh, kind of overdone. Uh, now, 53 reads, a car can go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. It's about 75 about 75 miles an hour in 10 seconds. If the engine delivered twice the power, how many seconds would it take? A car goes from 0 to 100 in 10 seconds. If the car delivered twice the power, how many seconds would it take? All right, let's see. So uh, twice the power means twice the work in the same amount of time or the same work in half the time. To achieve the same change in speed with twice the power means the work can be done in half the time or five seconds. So, you know, you want twice the power, you're going to half the denominator. They're indirect. So if I want to double the power, you know, power and time are indirect. So if I want to double the power, I want to have the the time. Okay. Uh, if a car traveling at 60 kilometers per hour will skid 20 meters when its brakes lock, how far will it skid if it is traveling at 120 kilometers per hour when its brakes lock? This question is typical of some on some driver's licenses exams. Uh, I'd like you to tell me if that's actually true. I it sounds a little weird. Twice the speed means four times the kinetic energy and four times the work to reduce to reduce the kinetic energy to zero. F is constant, so D equals 80 meters. Okay, so that's your those are your book problems. Uh, actually, the last three or four are pretty important. So good luck. Uh, make sure that you. Uh, do as many problems as you can for extra credit. The more book problems you do, the better. And uh, take care, and uh, bye.